get started on reading our scripture, which is found in Luke 19, 1 through 10. If you have it, you can feel free to look in your Bibles or you can feel free to look up at the screen. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran in ahead and climbed the sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he was going to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Amen. God is still speaking. This is the word of God. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. O God of love and justice, come to us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to live lives of grace and faithfulness. And may we know what it means for salvation to come into our lives like it did for Zacchaeus so long ago. Bless the speaking, the hearing, and the living of your holy word. Amen. So I always felt a connection with Zacchaeus. You can probably <laughs> guess why, because I'm a wee little man. <laughs> i got to use my box to stand on. Not a sycamore tree, but at least it's a box. Thanks, George, for making that for me. You know, and actually, when I was a kid in youth group, there was a, a taller boy in the youth group that would make fun of me and he'd sing that song to me over and over again. He'd scratch up his little head. <laughs> Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was, was he, he'd say. And he just thought I was that tall. <laughs> but what makes someone a wee little man or a big man for that matter? And actually by the world standards, although Zacchaeus may have been challenge like me in the <laughs> stature of height. There was really a lot about Zacchaeus that would really be envied today. He was rich. He had a great job. Maybe he wasn't that popular with the, the little folk. <laughs> that is, those without money or power or prestige, but he still had plenty of friends. Zacchaeus had made it. You might even say the American dream. He was well off. He was comfortable. He was safe and secure. He could retire knowing that he would never be lacking. Maybe he was a bit shrewd. But to get ahead, you've got to make certain choices. You know, good choices for business, right? Good capitalism demands it. Are you running a business here or a charity? I mean, you have to be serious about these things. But how does that measure up to how God looks on a person? Do you think God really cares how big your bank account is? How much money you make? That you have membership at fancy country clubs or all the toys and the stuff and the things that you've accumulated or that you can buy or win? What is it that God looks for? In a person. The willingness to do anything to get ahead, to satisfy one's own ego, one's own perceived needs that they think they need? No. Compassion, mercy, love, justice. These are the things that hold sway over the Lord's heart. And Jesus looks with eyes longing to see folks make choices in their lives that live up to the gospel, that demonstrate those kinds of values that Jesus held so precious. And Zacchaeus.
Zacchaeus, his very little name literally means justice. You may not know that. Zacchaeus means justice. And in this story, he lived up to his name, to what God deems as justice. So how would you measure up, you might ask? And you have to forget the way that the world sees you for a moment. Because again, we have, to, we have to look and we have to think about how is God seeing us? Are we we little men? Or do we have hearts as big as Texas? For a world out there that desperately needs your love. Because we've got to be honest. That's what God wants of you and your life. In a lot of ways, following Jesus revolves, and I thought about this time this week, you can think about it in two themes, maybe. One is grace, and the other is faithfulness. Now, in some ways, those can seem contradictory, but they, they really work together. Grace and faithfulness. Now, the truth is, theologians and folks and pre preachers and everybody have been trying to, to kind of put this into words for centuries. You know how? And they use different concepts to talk about these things. But sometimes that goes beyond us. And, and so I, I always try to think of things more calmly. And the way of Christ, both for individuals and for the greater church, to think of our lives revolving around grace and faithfulness. Now, let's start with grace. That's the easy one, right? Grace is everything in a word that we love about the Lord. I mean, grace abounds. Grace is such a gift. The definition of grace is that it is a gift that cannot be earned. It's a favor that we know that we don't deserve. And although we might even be able to understand that definition on some kind of intellectual basis, the truth is only one who has experienced this most blessed gift, a gift that is given freely and unexpectedly, can ever really know what grace means. Think about the words that we associate with grace. Mercy, love, forgiveness. Grace is like the dawn of a new day, bringing hope and new life. We picture God overflowing with unconditional love, ready to sweep us off our feet and give, this, give us this great big bear hug of a hug with love so deep. When I pray, sometimes I imagine God like a wonderful, soft, comfy blanket that I wrap around myself, especially on cold days like this before. Yeah. Really nice and warm. And just you find this spot of peace. And it shields you from all the icky stuff that's out there, right? All that stuff that brings stress and strife and suffering. There's violence and hunger and oppression and injustice. But in that moment, I am surrounded by that grace, that blanket of God's love. That all just goes away. And I'm left content and resting in God. And overwhelmed so much that it's, it's like there is a glow in my heart that floods through my entire body and my life. That's grace. And God gives it to every single one of us. Sometimes we can't quiet ourselves to be able to hear it. But God wants to give that grace to all of us. And it is absolutely free. doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person, somewhere in between. God wants you to have that feeling. And at its heart, grace is a totally selfless gift. All right, let's talk about faithfulness for a while. To be faithful to the Lord. Now, faithfulness, I think it, it, it's a little, to, to really, from the way I understand faithfulness, you have to kind of do it in steps. I mean, how do you follow God's word? How do you follow God's will? How do you embody the grace that I was just talking about? You know, and so I'm going to divide faithfulness at the, at the moment into two words, trust and discipleship. And I'm always big on discipleship. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I quote him all the time. 
So you should read The Cost of Discipleship, by the way, by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, if you have. Read that book, it'll change your life. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about discipleship. Discipleship means following in the footsteps of Jesus. Right? We're supposed to do the same things that Jesus did. We're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to, when you talk about discipleship, you're talking about sacrifice. You're talking about service. It means helping others. It means loving others. It means being Christ to one another. When I think about faithfulness, that makes me think of the cross. And the cross is also an emblem of grace. And I give thanks to God that I am forgiven of my sins and that I have life eternal with God. But sometimes we put everything about the cross just on Jesus when Jesus turns around and tells us all the time in the Gospels, if you want to be my followers, what do you got to do? You got to pick up your cross. We don't want to hear that, do we? We want to leave it all on Jesus and let him save us and that's it. But Jesus has the words that lead to eternal life. And if we want to follow as disciples, that means there's a cross for me and there's a cross for you. And we pick that up because it brings us life. Sacrifice, service, discipleship, to take this up willingly. And when you say cross, it's not just some burden that you're forced to share. I mean, when Jesus says that, he's saying, you're, the, you're supposed to follow me and do the kind of cross that I took up. And crosses mean humiliation. Crosses mean suffering. Crosses mean rejection. Crosses mean death. Who in the world would actually take that on? And yet Jesus invites us to do the same. Because crosses don't really mean death. They mean life. Justice. Zacchaeus' name is justice. That I often say the being of God, the quality of God, his love, his grace, his faithfulness, but the will of God is justice. God wants you to be faithful so that justice can happen on this earth. And all that icky stuff that's out there that I talked about, when you get that discipleship, bug in your heart, then you want to go outside and help to, to change the way the world is and bring love to a world that desperately needs it. And finally, with that faithfulness and that grace comes trust. Trust that God will see us through. That God will help us dance between grace and discipleship. And that God will carry us on to do the Lord's work. All that icky stuff, that suffering, the injustice that is out there, the violence, the hunger, that grace, sure, it will shield us. But faithfulness compels us outside those doors, outside our comfort zones. And through us, we will change the world. You cannot have grace without commitment. You cannot have love without service. You cannot have peace without justice. And you cannot have eternal life without a surrender to God's will. That's what it means to live between grace and faithfulness. I think the sad thing is, many folks, it, it's hard to really trust in that truth. They don't get what Jesus Paul and Jesus is about. I mean, and we know this. I mean, churches sometimes they, they you know, sometimes they, they don't seem to, um, if they don't stress both grace and discipleship, then I believe it cheapens the gift of God. It cheapens what God, what Jesus Christ has shown all of us. Without any call to service or sacrifice, God can become a kind of giant candy dispenser. And following the Lord is fundamentally about giving yourself over to God. But it, it's about serving your neighbor. It gets into turning something more that's about self-interest. And not about selfless humility and sacrifice. Grace is a gift that all of us need. 
And the Lord does not withhold it from anyone. Jesus reached out to Zacchaeus, and he's reaching out to us as well. God wants you to follow God's word and do God's will. And you can't say that you have grace in your heart if you don't care about the poor or help those in need. You can't love the Lord without sacrifice, commitment, and service. Now Zacchaeus always, I love this story because it, it gives me hope on a very personal level. Because in a lot of ways, not just because I'm little, I'm a lot like Jesus. And really, in the United States, all of us are a lot like Zacchaeus. We're rich by the world standards. We're comfortable. We're not like some leper in the Bible that gets healed by Jesus. No, probably <laughs> most of us, if we were going to identify with somebody in the Bible who Jesus helped, it'd be Zacchaeus. But the good news is, Zacchaeus figured it out. There is hope. He got it right. He left behind what the world said was important. And he became the kind of man that God wanted him to be. When Zacchaeus accepted the grace of Jesus Christ, he boldly declared that he would make amends. That he would move in his life to set things right. This man, who whose name literally means justice, would now do what is needed to be done in order to bring about restoration, enacting justice, true justice, not as the world works, but justice as in the kingdom of God. In the NRSV, what Tia read for us, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as But what is interesting, my friends, is actually the NRSV translates that phrase a bit wrong. The tense is wrong. It's, that was the future tense that I just read. Do you know that in the Greek, it's actually the present tense that Jesus uses, that Zacchaeus says? The present tense. So it would be more like this. It's not, I will give to the poor. It's, I give to the poor. I give to the poor. I am paying back. Zacchaeus isn't waiting. It's not just some promise that Zacchaeus is making. He's not having this moment of grace in his life. And you know, he's, he, and you know we, we've all been there, right? We make this change of heart, right? And we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and I'm going I'm I'm to make things right. And we all know that in a few days, we don't always make things right, do we? But in this passage, Zacchaeus makes it right, right there. It's amazing. It is justice in the kingdom of God. Today salvation has come to this house, Jesus says. And the Savior, our Savior even goes on to name Zacchaeus as a son of Abraham. This person, although he may have been rich by the world's standards, he was still an outsider in his religious circle, right? God's own law, being a tax collector, made him a known sinner. So he was outside. But Jesus just made him a son of Abraham and said that this person is a son of God. Zacchaeus wasn't a wee little man anymore. He was a big man for God. Because that's what matters. That's what eternal life is about. To know God intimately. <clears throat> and to be the Lord's vessel. I pray, my friends, that we will all come to understand this. It is not easy. But if you can truly surrender to the Lord, give your heart and get wrapped up in God's loving, comfy blanket of grace and be willing to pick up that cross and walk in the path of Jesus, 
and you will discover what it truly means to be saved and to know the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.